Hi everybody, I'm Andrew, and I gotta tell you, we were a little stumped about who to cover next and how to kill. But you guys made it abundantly clear who you're most afraid of and who you most want to see six feet under. So today, we're taking a trip down south to tell you how to kill Leatherface. At first, I figured that this would be easy. I mean, there's nothing supernatural about this chainsaw slinging, dancing and singing, icon of fleshy fashion. Leatherface, after all, isn't a teleporting zombie or a demonic dream master. He's just one tough-ass Texan with a taste for human flesh. But he's actually one of the most resilient slashers out there. He's only died in one of seven on-screen appearances. And between all the remakes, prequels, and semi-sequels, there's not a lot of concrete intel when it comes to taking this big butcher down. So, let's start with the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre from 1974, where Leatherface's rampage is halted by a wrench in the works. In 1973, Sally Hardesty, her immensely annoying brother Franklin, and some friends hit the road to investigate rumors of a grave robbing in Texas. My granddaddy's buried here. Can we find out if anything happened to him? After picking up a deranged hitchhiker, the gang stumbles on an old house filled with human remains and a family of crazed cannibals. That's where Leatherface makes his debut and establishes his classic killing repertoire. Right from the get-go, he's bludgeoning people with hammers, hanging them on meat hooks, and of course, sawing up a helpless fat man in a wheelchair. It's kind of funny. Sally, I hear something. Stop! Stop! <laughs> After an awkward dinner party, Sally breaks free and runs for the highway with Leatherface and the hitchhiker in hot pursuit. Then a 16-wheeler comes out of nowhere and splatters the hitchhiker all over the asphalt. And that is somehow really satisfying. The driver nails Leatherface with a pipe wrench right in the nog. It knocks him on his ass and his chainsaw slices into his leg, but it barely phases him. He limps after his prey, but she already escaped in a passing pickup truck. And all Leatherface can do is kind of dance in frustration. Over a decade later, in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, he's back in fighting shape. I mean, he's able to slice off someone's head in a moving vehicle from on top of a moving vehicle while wearing someone else's body. I can't even pull that off in GTA, and I've never had a chainsaw tear at my leg. Leatherface has an updated look, some fun new family members, and a nemesis truly worthy of his blade. Because at the end of this movie, Leatherface dies in a duel with Dennis Hopper. Hopper plays Sally's uncle, a Texas Ranger named Lefty, who's searching for the truth behind the original massacre. The laws. They shy away from piecing it together as murder. They call it accidents, disappearances. You got that last slaughter on tape, you play it on the radio. Maybe then the laws will stop trying to shut me up and start helping me. He locates the Sawyer compound and shows up loaded for bear with three chainsaws. Lefty tears up the house and kicks some cannibal ass. Boys, boys, boys. Culminating in a power tool duel, with Leatherface himself. The two lock saws in an epic battle until Lefty gets the upper hand and impales Leatherface right through the gut. He keeps on fighting though, until his older brother drops a hand grenade that blows up everyone in the room. It'd be pretty tough to explain how the big guy survives this one, so the next movie just doesn't. Leatherface, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3, opens up with our boy back in the habit. Only now he's got a big leg brace, probably from his accident in the first movie, which you would think that they would include in the second movie, but then they didn't. He's got a whole new family too, including a young Viggo Mortensen as his brother, Tex. So, if you ever wanted to see Aragorn get roasted alive by the dude from Dawn of the Dead, look no further. Now that he's the star, Leatherface is more dangerous and disgusting than ever. He used to be portrayed as a childlike brute, but he's downright angry in this one. 
The producer said that Leatherface is in his rebellious teenager phase during this movie, which would explain his weakness for hard rock. Leatherface chases our heroes Benny and Michelle into a swampy bog. God! God! He slices Benny's head open with his beautiful new golden chainsaw, because you've got to spend all those Overwatch competitive points somewhere, I guess. But as he's crawling out of the water, Michelle smashes his face with a nearby boulder. After whacking him 11 times, Leatherface sinks below the surface, never to be seen again. Until the last shot of the movie. As Michelle escapes, Leatherface limps into frame and revs his chainsaw as the credits roll. Classy. The next entry in the series, The Next Generation, is easily the weirdest. Don't you go crawling off. They shot this movie in 1995, but contract issues kept it on the shelf for two years. Then, after leads Renee Zellweger and Matthew McConaughey became huge stars, the studio redid the poster and rushed it out to cash in on their new fame. This one takes some liberties with the Texas Chainsaw lore. For one thing, the family has a new, extremely unsubtle name, the Slaughters. They're also no longer cannibals. Instead of feasting on human flesh, the family has a fun pizza party instead. You try to tell them I'm gonna stop off at the pizza place to pick up some dinner, all right? We get some insight into their origins this time around. Turns out the whole massacring people with chainsaws thing is just a job for the Slaughter family, aptly named. They've been hired by the literal Illuminati to show people the true meaning of horror, whatever that means. I want these people to know the meaning of horror. Horror. Is that clear? An official Illuminati plane helps Renee Zellweger escape by slicing off the top of Matthew McConaughey's head with the propeller. It just misses Leatherface, though. And after his prey hops into an official Illuminati limo, he's left to dance alone once more. This guy really knows how to get over his problems. He just dances it out. It's, it dances like no one's watching. When it comes to slasher movies, once you start getting bogged down in cults and conspiracies, it's probably a sign to step away and take some time before doing it again. It happened with Halloween, it happened with Friday the 13th, and it happened with the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So the series vanished, until 2003, when Michael Bay's Platinum Doom's production company bought us a remake. And compared to the relatively light on gore original, the Bayhem is cranked up to 11. Leatherface survives the film, which makes sense. I mean, you don't want to kill off your star at the beginning of a new reboot series. But even if he can't die, he can still be disarmed. Near the end of the remake, Jessica Biel finds herself hiding in a locker, solid snake style. This reminds me of when we first met. While Leatherface is distracted by an adorable little pig, she hacks his arm off with a meat cleaver. How's that? Taste of your own fing medicine. Sorry. He takes a breather to gather his thoughts and rallies enough for one last scare as she escapes into the night. We never actually get to see what happens to the remake Leatherface after the first movie. So God only knows what kind of sick prosthetic he's whipped up to replace his arm. Probably uh, another chainsaw if you gave me a million guesses. Groovy. The next movie, The Beginning, was a prequel. So unless the series takes a hard sci-fi turn, it's safe to say he survived that one. Same deal with this year's Leatherface, which is set in the OG timeline, before the first film. We learn more about his origins, why he wears the mask, and where he gets all those wonderful toys, but it's not particularly helpful when it comes to killing him. Neither is Texas Chainsaw 3D, which ignores every movie but the original. Leatherface is actually kind of sympathetic in this one. I mean, as sympathetic as one can be while dismembering people and tossing them into meat grinders. And after he finds his long-lost cousin Heather, the two live a happy life inside their mansion of death. 
At the end of the day, Leatherface is just a mortal man with a gassed up chainsaw and one hell of an appetite. It's not voodoo magic or nano machines keeping him alive, it's the kindness and support of his loving family. So keep your loved ones close, call your brother, feed your grandpa, because you never know when that next band of teenagers is gonna run out of gas. Hey guys, we're all big fans of that cuddly cannibal Leatherface here at Now This, and now that you guys know how to kill him, we need to know who to cover next. Let us know in the comments who you want to see Six Feet Under. And as always, please subscribe to Now This Nerd, and watch out if you hear a chainsaw noise, because it might be you next! No!